time, at the end of the class, we discussed one pretty hard question. Yeah. So the question is: Is it possible to study unknown algorithms when we want to study if some algorithm is optimal or not? We need to consider all the possible algorithms, including unknown algorithms, and make sure none of them can beat the current one. Yeah. So that's the optimality issue. Yeah. Here we need to do that. Yeah. The hard part is if you do not know the details of some of the algorithms, how can you say? Those unknown algorithms cannot beat the current one. Yeah. So we had the answer last time. The answer is yes, we can do it. Yeah. How can we do it? Yeah. So here the answer is this: We can discover some common property for. All those algorithms. If you can discover certain common properties, then you can solve this problem. All right. So let's look at that part. Yeah. All right. So now uh, we want to convince people the current algorithm is optimal. All right. So let's start. Yeah. Question. How to convince people that the algorithm is optimal? Yeah. So here, we need to make a sequence of convincing arguments. Yeah. So to do that, we need to rely on our real-world experience and using our imaginations to make some convincing story. Yeah. So what kind of real-world experience? Here, we like to use some experience that everyone is familiar with. So that's the playing sports games. So when people play sports games, then we know、uh, many players they need to play each other, and a good player.、Uh, Try to be their opponents, right? Yeah. So we use that scenario. Try to help us understand the situation when we do the comparisons. Yeah. All right. So here,、uh, let's use the sports games, sports matches. To do some analogy、uh, on our comparisons.、Yeah. So when we do comparisons, just like、uh, two players do a match, a match between two players. Well, comparison. Yeah. One player beats another one. Similar to one element. Beats another element, right? Yeah, pretty similar. Yeah, all right. Yeah, and the results for the comparison or for the sports match like this. Yeah, when we have less than comparison result. Yeah,、uh, here for our particular problem because here we are. Trying to find the minimum of the array. That means the smaller the element, the smaller the element, the better. As we want, right? Yeah, because we, our goal, we want to find the smallest element of all. That means smallest element would be the final winner, right? So. Here, less than, we want to make it correspond to win in a match of two players. 
equal tie and greater than lose. Yeah. And uh, this uh, kind of, uh, you know, one-to-one uh, -one correspondence could be changed if we, for example, we want to find a maximum, right? Maximum that the larger the value, the better, right? So we should pick winner of two elements whose value is larger, right? For the maximum, yeah. Yeah, depends on the requirement of the question, yeah. All right, yeah. So let's uh, look at another special property. So in this kind of analogy, uh, it's not completely the same. Something slightly different. Yeah. One difference is here, the transitivity property. Yeah. In our comparisons, we have the transitivity property. But in sports match, we do not have it. Yeah. So here we have to you know, see this point. Yeah. The transitivity property is when we compare numbers P A greater than P B, yeah. so player A beats player B, and P B greater than P C, then by the transitivity, we automatically we have P A greater than P C. Yeah. That's in our you know basic inequality property, transitivity property, we have this. Yeah. But in sports games, we do not have this. Even player A beats player B, player B beats player C. You cannot say player A must beat player C. Yeah, yeah. So we know the key difference between these two different types of comparisons. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But in our discussion, we need to use this transitivity property. Yeah. So we need to, you know, add it. Uh, in our convincing argument. Yeah. Yeah. Here, to add it, we find this property. Okay? So we allow indirect comparisons. Yeah. So here, what is the indirect comparisons? Direct, we know direct. Player A and player B, they do match directly, you know, direct, right? Comparison, uh, element one and element two, we do comparison between them directly. Yeah, that's the direct comparison. But indirect, so that's here, all right? Yeah, for example, we do comparison between PA and PB. Yeah, so that's one comparison. Another comparison, PB with PC, another. The comparison. After we finish those two comparisons, because we can get a PA beats PC automatically from the transitivity, so we do not need to do another direct comparison between PA and PC. So in this way, we call PA beats PC indirectly. And we treat, yeah, there, there is no comparison between PA and the PC, so we treat, you know, uh, some imaginary comparison between PA and the PC is indirect comparison. Okay, so that's our meaning. Yeah. So the comparison here, indirect comparison actually is imaginary. All right? Imaginary, not the real comparison okay yeah so it's a you know based on the transitivity yeah so there is a some phenomenon that give us the information just like we can get from a real comparison that kind of understanding okay yeah so after we make our preparation in this way so next we can, you know, we are ready to make the convincing argument in 
a sequence of statements. Yeah. All right. The first one. Uh, imagine that the minimum is the final winner. Yeah, that's obvious. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So here we are in the story. You know, sports game story. So the minimum is the final winner. Yeah. All right. Then the second one. It needs to beat all the other elements or players in the array through comparisons, directly or indirectly. Yeah. So look at here. So we here try to cover all the situations we allow indirect comparisons, imaginary indirect comparisons. Based on the transitivity, yeah. So that's okay. Yeah. So no problem. Yeah. All right. Next statement: If an element loses once, it is eliminated. Yeah. So if an element loses once, how can that element be the final winner? Cannot, right? The final winner must be the one. That wins all the way through, reach the end, right? Without any loss. Yeah. So this statement also very obvious. Yeah. All right. But here we use this word eliminated. So that means in this place <coughs> we need to apply the elimination method. Okay. Yeah. So this method is very important in this class, and we will apply it many, many times. Yeah. Here, this is our. Yeah. We can say the first time. Yeah. The first time. Yeah. Although when we solve this problem, the last time we already use it. Yeah. But it is the same problem, right? Yeah. So we can treat. So this is our first time we apply this elimination method. Yeah. All right. So here you can see, in order to get a final winner, we need to eliminate all the other n minus one elements. Only the final winner is not eliminated. Yeah. Other than that, all the other Elements are eliminated. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, but here, so let's look at yeah this one, this statement. Yeah, very critical. Okay. So, to make the whole thing, you know, reasonable. Yeah, this one is critical. Yeah. So, what's this one? Each comparison can only eliminate one element. Yeah, each comparison can only eliminate one element. Can you imagine one comparison eliminates two elements, both eliminated? That's not reasonable, right? Because the result of one comparison, one element beats another one. The winner. How can you eliminate the winner, right? Yeah. So in a sports game. How can you, you know, make the winner eliminated, right? Yeah. So you cannot do that, right? Yeah. So based on that, so we can see、uh, each comparison can only eliminate. Yeah. To be more precise, actually, at the most one element. Yes. At the most one. It could. It could be none. It could be zero. So here, let me add at the most one. Yeah. Yeah. At the most one element, zero or one. Yeah. One comparison does not eliminate any element or player. Yeah. Why? Because one comparison, you must have a loser. Why that loser? You do not treat treat it as eliminated. <laughs> Because here, 
there is a special situation. Yeah. Because think about uh, when we do comparisons in an algorithm, you cannot imagine all the algorithms are efficient. Some of the algorithms could be very bad, right? Some of the algorithm may not be efficient. That means for some of the algorithms, you may need to do many redundant comparisons. Yeah. So here the problem is, uh, you may do you may do redundant comparisons. That's possible, right? Unnecessary comparisons, yeah, because you may not keep track of all your comparisons. So when you apply, you know, certain comparisons, actually, it's it's not necessary. But you you do not keep track of all your comparisons, so you get lost. So you may do some redundant comparisons. If you do redundant comparisons, the loser probably already eliminated it before. So you do not add a new loser. You just do something useless. Yeah. So let that loser repeat it losing again, right? So we do not treat it as a new loser. So here we say uh, there is no new element eliminated after a particular comparison. Okay? So that's why we say each comparison can only eliminate at the most one element. Yeah. All right. So that's this because this one is the most important property uh, in order to make the final argument. Yeah. We need to use this one, the critical one. All right. So next, then. We are close to our final statement. We need to eliminate n minus one elements. Thus, we need at least n minus one comparisons. Yeah. So the first half sentence, that's obvious. That's what we need to get a final winner. We must eliminate n minus one elements other than the final winner. Right? So no problem. But how do you get that many elements eliminated? Okay? Through comparisons, right? Or we can say through effective comparisons, right? Yeah, can we say effective? No. Some comparisons not effective. Okay, redundant. Not effective. Yeah. Here. Thus we need at least n minus one comparisons. At least. Yeah cannot be fewer than n minus 1. Yeah? Because each comparison can only contribute at most one element elimination. So you need n minus 1, so you need at least n minus 1 comparisons. Okay? You may need more than n minus 1, yeah? because some of the comparisons are not effective. Okay? Yeah? So wasteful. You waste them. Yeah? And the minimum number of comparisons there must those must be effective comparisons. So that means you must have n minus one effective comparisons. So you can get all those n minus one elements eliminated. Alright? So that means the number of the number of comparisons yeah here, let me write here. The number of comparisons must be greater or equal to m minus one. Okay. Here you can see we cover those unknown algorithms, right? So all the unknown algorithms are covered. Yeah. Even we may not know a lot of details. Yeah. But we found some common property. Yeah. So the property we talk about here, 
here. They are the common properties among all such algorithms, right? Yeah, yeah. So we can get our final conclusion. So our algorithm solving this problem is optimal. Okay, optimal here it means no other people can improve this algorithm anymore, even for the future generations, nobody can do better than this one. Okay? Yeah. Because we prove it rigorously. Here, our proof is very rigorous. Okay? No, the logically, you know, no problem, very solid. Yeah. Nobody can you know, find any hole here. All right? Yeah. So, we complete the proof of optimality of this algorithm. Okay? Yeah. Here you can see, you know, it's not easy, but you can do it. Yeah. So, if you make some good effort, you can really do it. Yeah. All right. So, we finish this important uh, topic. Next, I want to, you know, just to use the result we get from finding minimum problem to do a little more. D.2, application, finding maximum and minimum, this problem. Okay, all right, yeah. First, let me give you the problem description. Yeah. Question. We are given an array with n distinct elements. Yeah. So here, this m should be greater than 1. Yeah. Because otherwise, if one element, then you don't need to do anything. Right? Yeah. So greater than 1. So you need to do some work. Yeah. Then, how to find both the maximum and the minimum simultaneously? So, in when you solve the problem, you need to tell us which element is the maximum, which element is the minimum, and you need to use the minimum number of comparisons. Yeah. That's what we need to do here. Okay? All right. Here, our data, so let's write we have these n elements, so we want to work on it. Okay, our data. Yeah. All right. Uh, before we try to solve this problem, let's do our first try here. Yeah. Our first try. Uh, because at this point, we already we have some background, so we can use our existing results. We can do something. Yeah. So our first try is like this. Uh, let's find the minimum first. Okay, the first because we need to find a, m both minimum and a maximum. So let's find a minimum first. We have the solution for that problem finding the minimum. Yeah. So that tells us we need n minus one comparisons. Right? Yeah. That's easy. Yeah. The second, after that, then we need to find a maximum. Okay, yeah. But this time, we try to do a little better. Yeah. Because minimum cannot be the maximum, right? Yeah. We observe the minimum cannot be the maximum. Okay, yeah. So that's pretty obvious. Because these n elements are distinct, based on our assumption, they are distinct. Yeah. Yeah. That means the minimum we've just found has no way to be maximum, so we can safely remove it from the consideration. That's the elimination method. So we apply the elimination method here, 
on the minimum, it can be eliminated. After it is eliminated, we only have m minus one elements left. Among these m minus one elements, what is the largest one? The maximum of it. So we apply our finding the minimum problem solution another time, although we make it the maximum version. Yeah. But the answer, we need n minus 2 more comparisons. Okay, yeah. So then, the total, yeah, because we need to do both, right? So the total equals adding these two numbers together, 2 and minus 3. Yeah. That's our first try. Yeah. Our answer is 2 and minus 3 comparison. Yeah. So the question, is it optimal? Is it the best we can get? Can we do a, a little better, right? Yeah. So here, we want to do better than this one. Yes. Yeah. Actually, this first try, this one, is not optimal. Yeah. The reason, here we can see something, why it is not optimal. Yeah. So we do comparisons here, two rounds. The first round, finding the minimum. The first round. Second round, finding the maximum. Yeah. In the first round, we make n minus 1 comparisons. Yeah. After these n minus 1 comparisons, we should collect a lot of useful information. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But after we get a minimum, we just eliminated the minimum, then we do not use any information from the first round. For the second round, we just start from scratch, assuming we know nothing. So here you can see we waste a lot of information collected from the first round in the second round. That's the reason this algorithm is not optimal because there is some room to improve. The way to improve, we should make use of all the comparison information from the first round. How? How to make use of that information part? That's another question. So that's, you know, you need to find a smart way to organize your data. After your data is well organized, then you can, you know, take advantage of the structure of your data to make use of all the information collected from the first round. That's the basic idea. Okay, all right, so let's try to improve along this way. All right, yeah. Review elimination method. Yeah. So this re elimination method, basically, so when certain elements do not satisfy the criteria, we can eliminate them from the consideration. Yeah. That's pretty straightforward, right? Yeah, obvious. But to use it in the right way, that's not easy. So you need a lot of experience to, you know, help you do better and better. Yeah. All right. Since the data size is reduced, yeah, because after you remove certain number of elements, you basically reduce the data size. And here, there is a simple, simple property. Yeah. So when the data size is reduced, we can achieve better efficiency. Yeah. 
So we can use fewer number of comparisons. That's the better efficiency. Yeah. But this property, yeah, to be more precise about this property, it is true in general. Yeah. In general. All right? Yeah. That means it's not 100% correct yeah sometimes it may not be correct there is some exception yeah here so let me give you the you know some interesting exception case yeah. so so when you use this property so you need to be careful yeah the exception is like this yeah here let me give you an exception case. All right, yeah. Consider prime factorization. So I think you, you know this, yeah. Prime number, prime factorization. Yeah, let's consider that, prime factorization, yeah. In prime factorization, yeah, so what is the data size? We do prime factorization on one integer number, yeah. m. That integer number m we treat as the data size. Yeah. Here it's different from our understanding of the, you know, our current data size. That's the number of elements in the array. We treat that as the data size. But this is another case of the data size. Only one number. Yeah, one number. Why we can treat this one number as the, because we use the value of this number. So we call it magnitude. So this place, we use the magnitude as the data size. So another way to understand the data size. Yeah, because given one number, we can. Uh, do prime factorization on it, yeah. So the number when it is very large, you know, sometimes hard, sometimes not hard, right? So that's the data size. Yeah. Here I like to compare two examples. The first one, when n equals one thousand, yeah. So you know, relatively large number. Yeah, not too large. Yeah, but you know, relatively large. So when we do com this prime comparison, very easy, right? So everyone can get the answer immediately. A times 125. A, we need to write prime representation. That is 2 cube times 5 cube. That's the prime factorization, right? Yeah? All right, but let's consider another m. That number is much smaller than 1,000. For example, like 357. Okay? Yeah. That's smaller than 1,000, but I believe everyone would agree to do prime factorization on this number is much harder than to do factorization on 1,000. Yeah, because you need to work on paper. You, you need to use more time to do it, right? Yeah, so we treat, as, we treat harder. So here you can see the data size smaller, but the difficulty of the problem is harder, okay? Just the opposite, if you compare, opposite to this property, right? Yeah. So th there are exception cases. Yeah. So we treat as exception cases. Yeah, but you know, ninety something percent chances uh, this property is available. So you can, you can, you you have the property ninety something percent. Okay. Yeah. So for that reason, uh, many times. We still we need to use that property, okay? Yeah. All right. So let's continue. Yeah. 
for discussion, convenience, we use this kind of notation. So when we do comparisons, we have winner and losers, right? Yeah. So the comparison, we may like to write, you know, a pair of elements inside a pair of parentheses, yeah, separated by comma, then we mark the winner, yeah, an arrow sign, the winner, yeah, something like that, okay, yeah, just, you know, some simple notation, so we do not need to write a, a lot of words, yeah, all right, and we know the winner is determined based on the requirement, yeah, sometimes smaller value, sometimes larger value, the winner, yeah, all right. Then, details of data manipulation. Yeah. How do we organize our data for comparisons? Yeah. The simplest, obvious way, yeah. just based on our experience in sports games, right? Yeah. So, we group data in pairs. We group players in pairs, right? You know, uh, the usual way, yeah, common way. Yeah. Here, x1, x2 in a group first comparison. x3, x4, another group second comparison, and so on. Okay? Until we group all possible players. Yeah. But can we get all elements paired? Sometimes we can, sometimes we cannot. Depends on you have even number of elements or odd number of elements. Okay? Yeah. So that should be considered. Even case and odd case should be considered. Okay? Yeah. All right. But we need to work on these two cases. Yeah. But the which one we should work first? Yeah. Here, when we have a few cases to consider, commonly use the strategy. We always work on the simplest case first. Yeah. Here, even case is simpler, right? Because the even case, all elements are paired. Yeah. That's the ideal case. For other case, you may not be able to pair all the elements. The last element is left, so you need to do some special treatment on the last element. So we want to delay the other case. Let's work on the even case first. Yeah. All right. Now, so let's apply this elimination algorithm again. Yeah. For this one. And uh, we need to work twice. The first time, we need to work on the even case. So for the even case, our n can be written, because it's an even number, usually we represent as 2k. Right? 2k. Okay? All right. So now, let me use a diagram to represent the meaning. Yeah. Because I want to save a lot of words. Yeah. I do not want to write you know, too many words here. Yeah. All right. The diagram for the first pair, comparison x2 and x1, I use this diagram. Okay? Here, I write x2 above x1, that means x2 is greater than x1, okay? So after one comparison, x2 is greater than x1. Yeah. Similarly, x4 is greater than x3, and so on, yeah, yeah. And here you can see the elements with even subscript is greater than the elements than the R subscripts. Yeah. The reason I organize it this way, 
because this is the simplest case. Yeah. In the real world comparisons, you may not have this kind of comparison result, but that's not that that a big deal, right? Yeah, because you know you can use different ways to make it happen. For example, you can swap two elements, right? Yeah. Here, just some notation, right? Even odd, you know, just the symbols. Yeah. Yeah. The bottom line is, you know, one element is greater than the other, right? In each pair, in each pair, one element is greater than the other. Yeah. The greater one, you put on top. The smaller one, you put at bottom. That's what you need to do, right? Yeah. All right. So here, based on that analysis, you can see after first round comparison. Here we do first round, right? Yeah. Pair between the pairs. First round comparisons. This first round, we do total k comparisons. Yeah. K comparisons, okay? Yeah. After K comparisons, can we get some useful information? Right? Useful information. Yeah. Here, so you can see, yeah. Basically, the top row, all these elements in the top row, we treat them as the winner's group. How about that? Because they all beat their opponents. So we can call them the winner's group. All right, yeah. Then, the bottom row, these elements, we call them loser's group. Yeah. Loser's group. Okay, yeah. So now, with this kind of characterization, two categories: okay, winners group, losers group, two different categories. Yeah, that's the way we organize our data. Okay, yeah. All right. Then think about our goal. We want to find both minimum and maximum. When we find a minimum, should we? Look for minimum inside the winners group. No, no, yeah. The minimum cannot be the winner, right? The minimum number cannot be greater than any other element in the array. Yeah. So first, you get your uh, important observation that is mean. Can be eliminated. Elimination method, okay? Eliminated from this group. Okay? This time you can see you eliminate one half of the elements, right? Because the minimum, you, you only need to consider the, in the bottom group, not top group. That means when you find the minimum, the top group, half of the elements are eliminated. That's a much bigger elimination than our first try, right? This time, we eliminate one half of the elements. Much bigger elimination, right? Yeah, similarly, Similarly, max max can be eliminated from this group. Here, all right? Yeah. See? That's the reason we can do better. All right? That's the reason we can do better. Yeah. All right. So let's look at two. So now the maximum should 
come from the top group. Yeah. How many comparisons to get a maximum from the top group? Yeah. K minus one comparisons. So this time we apply our finding minimum solution another time. Yeah. All right. Similarly, for the bottom group to get a minimum, we need another k minus one comparisons. All right. Yeah. At the end, let's calculate the total. Okay. At the end. The total number of comparisons. That is, we add three parts, right? The first round K, then two K minus one. Yeah. Final three K minus two. Yeah. K we know that's one half of n, so 3n over 2 minus 2 for the even case. That's the even case. So for the other case, yeah, so, so now I think for the other case, most part similar to the even case, but we just need to work out small difference. In particular, for the last element, that little difference part. Then we solve the problem. Yeah. So let's look at the other case here. For other case, this time we write n equals two k plus one. Yeah. All right. First, we still we pair. We try to pair our elements as much as we can. Yeah. Similar to even case. Yeah. Da da da. All right. Yeah. Two K the last pair. Two K minus one. Yeah. But there is the last element two K plus one, it's a singleton. Yeah. There is no pair for it. It's a singleton. Okay? So the question is how do we treat, how do we handle the last singleton element in some reasonable way? That's the question we need to answer. Yeah. If we can find a good answer for it, then we solve the problem. Yeah. All right. So here, I use one special way. Yeah. I do not say this is the only way. Yeah. Because different people, you may have different ways to deal with, handle the last element. Here, I use this special way. Yeah. I still pair the last element with itself. But it is not a real pair, right? Because we won't do comparison between one element with itself. So here I use dash the line, not a solid line. Solid line represent one com comparison. Okay, each solid line represents one comparison, but the dash line represents zero comparison. No comparison needed. But after we draw the dotted line, solid, you know, dash the line, we know one element is on top row, the same element also at the bottom row. So when we circle the top row elements, the singleton appears in the winner's group. When we circle the bottom row, the singleton also appears in the losers group because this element is possible to be the maximum and minimum. 
So we should consider this special element in both groups. That's the reason. So we need to, you know, include it twice in two groups. That's the only difference we need to make yeah, comparing with the previous case. Yeah. All right. So after we make this adjustment, small adjustment, now we can find a solution. Okay, yeah. So the first round, this first round, still K comparisons. All right, yeah. Second round, second round, you can see we need to get a max from the top group. The top group, there are k plus 1 elements. In k plus 1 elements, we want to find a maximum. So that number minus 1. So that means we need also k comparisons. OK, yeah, all right. Here, find the minimum among also k plus 1 elements. So we need k comparisons. All right, yeah. Then, this time we can calculate the total number of comparison, 3k comparisons. All right. 3k, we can convert it to n. So what's that? 3 times n minus 1 over 2. Yep. The expression is slightly different from the previous version. Yep. But later you will see, yep, actually, uh, it's possible we can write one expression to cover both cases. Yeah. But in that situation we need to use the you know the seeding function. Seeding function type for both cases. Covering both. One formula to give answer for both both cases. Yeah we can do that. Okay? Yeah. Then after this much work, you can see we solve the problem, although much harder than the first solution, but much better than the first solution. Right? Yeah. The first, compared with the first solution, the first, the number of comparison approximately 2n. Yeah. 2n minus 3. So that minus 3 too small, so we can ignore it. Yeah. But second solution, approximately 3n over 2, right? Yeah. So we drop the, you know, minus something, that part. So 3n over 2. How much better? Yeah. If we count from the first case to n, you can see that is about 25% reduction. That's quite significant, right? That's quite significant. Yeah. So it's worth the effort. Yeah. So we, we like to make that much improvement. 25% yeah. improvement. All right? Yeah? All right. Yeah, but there is another thing, because this part, our topic, main topic is optimality. So the question, how do you know the second solution is optimal? Right? How can you show it? Yeah, it looks optimal, yeah, because we are doing comparisons in a very efficient way. Very, very efficient. Yeah, so we try to save all the useful information 
and we do not waste you know it looks like we do not waste any useful information yeah, but how do you know how to convince people how to convince people nobody can do better than this one this solution right yeah yeah so in order to convince people what do you need to do similar to what we did in the our previous problem that one but here the arguments the convincing argument would be much harder to make yeah. but it's possible yeah yeah it's possible uh, uh, I see the solution so there is a solution I see it in another book yeah so it's very smart yeah very smart you know argument yeah all right yeah but for this class uh, I do not try to go that far yes yeah. so because that solution is very difficult very difficult yeah I won't go that far okay yeah if uh, it's possible I may make a video to you know talk about that story yeah but you know that's optional okay not required yeah all right so we finish this whole optimality topic yeah all right before we finish today's class I like to talk about our project our first project uh, evaluate polynomials efficiently uh, you know the general idea I want to talk about okay all right yeah so in this project I ask you to implement several methods and then do comparisons oh, yeah. so the first method I like you to implement that's the brute force method just your usual way to do the additions multiplications brute force yeah All right. we know that's very bad yeah but for the comparison uh, you do it first the second one Horner's rule Horner's rule method implementation okay yeah so they both this should return the same result yeah because if you see different result then one must be false at least one must be false yeah because if you are both methods you implement correctly they should return the same number yeah here in order to make sure you return the same number we use integer data integer data for the coefficients all the coefficients must be integer and the x value also must be integer okay yeah can we cannot use floating point data because if you use floating point data then the final result from these two methods is slightly different because the you know computing rounding error yeah. so here floating point data if people use floating point data because of the rounding error you cannot avoid the rounding error of computers rounding error would cause the final result slightly different the last few digits yeah, the last a few digits will be different yeah, although that part is relatively small, but we like to see 
exact the same result. Yeah. So for that reason, we choose integer data. Okay. All right. Then, other than these two methods, we also learned. Remember from our notes last time, repeated squaring. method and number four repeated cubing these two yeah repeated cubing these two are used for monomial evaluation because we can do much better for monomial evaluations and in the polynomial, remember, for a typical polynomial, we write a standard form like this. The general term like this. All right, you need to evaluate all these monomials, right? When you evaluate monomial, you just use repeated squaring, okay? Yeah. On, uh, because repeated squaring and the cubing, the difference is very small, okay? One, only, you know, at the most one difference, one compare, one multiplication difference, yeah. You, you just take repeated squaring, yeah. You use that as our third method third method in this project. Okay? Method 1, method 2, method 3. Method 3, still you evaluate polynomial, but when you calculate the monomial, you use repeated squaring. That's the third method. Okay? Yeah. All right. But after that, there is another step you need to do. Yeah. Just to compare compare them. These two methods. Compare these two methods. Yeah. Because we are curious. Yeah. We know we know they are very close. Not exactly the same. They are very close. But we still we want to know for what n number repeat squaring is better, for what n number repeated cubing method is better. So we are curious, okay? So the last thing I'd like you to do is you need to do the comparison specifically for n through the range of integer from 100 through 200. Okay? Yeah. So, so you, you make that list. You make that list. At 100, repeated squaring use certain number of comparisons. Repeated cubing, certain number of comparisons. Yeah. That's the first row. Okay? So 100 row. Then 101. So this is one, 100 row. Okay? 101. Repeated squaring, repeated cubing, number of comparisons, and so on. Then the last line is 200. Okay? Yeah. So you print out this result on the screen. So then we can see which one is better, which one worse, you know, all the same immediately. But only work on these numbers. That's enough. Yeah. So we just want to get an idea. Okay? All right. That's what we need to do in this project. Yeah. So I will write, uh, you know, project description, the details. Yeah. So all these things I will write clearly in my project description. So then I will give you, after I post it, I will give you one month to complete it. Okay? All right. So.
let us finish the whole module one right here.